Hi everybody, my name's Darren, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I want to thank Neil for asking me to come out here and ruining my weekend. Just kidding, just kidding. I love AA. I want to thank Jeremy for picking me up. That's some commitment that, driving an hour to pick me up from the airport and then coming down here and he's got to take me back after. So that's being of service right there. I want you to know I'm the worst drunk I've ever met. I can't believe I'm sober. I can't believe I'm sober and I'm happy. Is there any party animals in here tonight? Any party animals? Anyone used to be good at drinking and doing drugs? I used to be good at it. So this is the last thing I ever wanted to do was come to AA. Oh my God. Can you believe it? And now it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. But I, I wasn't feeling like that at all. AA. So I'm from Santa Barbara. I know I don't sound like it. Uh, I'm from Manchester, England, and they would show Alcott's Anonymous on the telly in England, and it looked so depressing you couldn't believe it. <laughs> it would show like a smoky filled, miserable room with 14 men, and they're all bald, fat, ugly, miserable. <laughs> one of them's like one week sober, they're all clapping and crying. <laughs> like, oh my God, I never want to end up there. You see how depressing it is. And then by the, by the end of my drinking, that's the only place anyone's telling me to go. The doctors, the psychiatrists, friends that were reluctant to talk to me, but they would, they were like, you need to go to AA. I'm like, you don't understand, mate. I'm already suicidally depressed. <laughs> Why do you want to send me to A&A? Is it just to finish me off quicker? It makes no sense. I also had a, a preconceived notion of what it means to be an alcoholic. And it can't be, many of you in here don't look like you're alcoholic, you're too young. Well, some of you look like you've had a good drink. <laughs> but you're too young, too beautiful, too well put together. That's what I, I don't see an alcoholic. It's the bum on Main Street with a big bushy beard. I know big bushy beards came in again, so don't get offended. But with a dirty tan begging for change, that's an alcoholic. It can't be me. Like I said, I used to be a party animal, so... It took a lot for me to get here. This is the last, last place. But I think it works better when this is the last house on the block. There was nowhere else for me to go. I was, I'm not like a cute little drunk. I'm not a functioning alcoholic. I'm a vodka drinking maniac. You know, so you kind of run out of options. And uh, so I remember I was... Uh, in Santa Barbara on the west side of town, I'm staying in a crappy house in a shitty room. Three of the bartenders I'd been fired for my job. And I was just drinking myself to death. And I'm suicidal on awakening. You know, if you weren't suicidal on awakening, I bet you wouldn't mind if a bus run you over, right? We just, we just get like that. And, and I'm maudlin drunk and it's about midnight. My roommates are downtown partying, having excluded me again as usual, which made for more self-pity. And I, I, I figured, okay, I'm gonna call this AA bullshit. I'm gonna, I, I found the yellow pages. You young'uns will have to Google that shit, won't you? <laughs> I found the yellow pages. It took me forever to find AA. That's how drunk I was. <laughs> it's in the beginning of the book, you dumbass. Oh, shit. And I called, and this, you, and by the way, you lot, here are so welcoming, had so many nice chit chats, just feel fit right in right away. Some real degenerates, you know what I mean? <laughs> but this woman that answered the phone, she was so nice and so kind to me. And, uh, and I was telling her right out the gate, yeah, I might drink too much. You drink as much as I did if what's happened to me had happened to you. I'm going to kill myself. The world would be better off without me, blah, blah, blah. And she said, there's a, there's a meeting. Oh, have you never been to a meeting? There's a meeting tomorrow night, not too far away from you. She made it sound so special. I didn't know there were 200, 200 meetings a week in Santa Barbara. I'm like, okay, well, if, that, if, it's, if it's on tomorrow. And uh, I finished the job that night, passed out, came to the next day. <clears throat> and I was just cornered. The only reason I came to AA, because I was cornered. So begrudgingly as well. And uh, I can't say I didn't drink the next day. Dude, if I have to leave my bedroom, let alone my house, I have to have a bit of vodka in me, you know what I mean? Especially if I'm doing something really weird, like 
interacting with another human. <laughs> I got to have some vodka in me. And so, uh, you know, I, I showered for the first, I, I, I drank minimally, but I drank, and, and it, it was an eight o'clock meeting. And I showered for the first time in months, and I gelled my hair all sexy like I used to be able to back then. <laughs> and I went sauntering into this meeting, and it was just like this. Nothing like I'd seen on the telly. There was a vibe about it all. There was a vast amount of fun about it. It was a men's stag. There were 80, 80 or 90 men in this meeting hall. Now, I'm just like observing what's going on. I'm not obviously participating. I sat down. I don't want to catch anything from these happy fucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm an observer. But they're all stoked to see each other. Someone had gotten a promotion. Someone else had gotten engaged. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. This is not like I thought it was going to be. And then what happened next really captured my attention. The meeting was about to start. The secretary sat down. Everybody shut up, got off their phones, respected the meeting, and was sat in this huge circle with another circle around it. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And, I th and as the meeting started, I thought this is a good time. I opened my jacket pocket. I pulled out a big bottle of vodka and started drinking. <laughs> In the meeting, the guy next to me is like, holy fuck, this guy, he's drinking vodka in the meeting. I was astounded that nobody else was drinking. My, isn't this Alcox Anonymous? Don't you have a drinking problem? I have a real bad drinking problem. It confused me. It took me three months to figure out, drink, I was drinking, I got quite the reputation back in Santa Barbara then, drinking openly in meetings. It took me three months to figure out what you cheeky monkeys were doing. <laughs> you lot were putting your vodka in a water bottle, all polite like, and then going to the meeting. So I finally, I figured out I put my vodka in the water bottle, couldn't wait to go to the meeting. So one of you lot get the water bottle out, I got mine out, hey, cheers mate. <laughs> drinking with you like oh my god I can't believe I stayed drunk for a year in Alcott's Anonymous jails institutions and death man are the only three outcomes for an alcoholic of my type of the books type maybe of your type jails institutions and death no joke I was going to jail for drunk for stupid stuff drunk in public DUI I was going to institutions, I go to detox a lot, I go to the hospital a lot, I go to the drunk tank. You know, I'm getting picked up all over the place and I finally started going to the lockdown psychiatric unit regularly. That had become normal. And death was close. And death was welcome, man. You can't scare an alcoholic with death at that stage of drinking. Like, bring it on, man, bring it on. But alcoholism doesn't have the dignity to take us quickly. It's going to mess with some of us for, for years or decades. My fear is not dying an alcoholic death. My fear is living an alcoholic life. Stuck in that grey suicidality area. One miserable day at a time. Oh my God. Now I started drinking at 13 in England. Now I thought like, you know, someone's going to fall off the chair. Like 13, oh my God, that's outrageous. Like, nope, not nowadays. 13, you boring little bastard. I was drinking when I was eight. Oh, shut up. Who cares? What I realise is nobody, you can't outdo anybody in AA. This is the worst place to try that. So don't even try, right? This one woman speaker in California, she's great. I've spoke with her at conventions, but I always make fun of her. Because her whole story, she gives a great talk, but her whole pitch surrounds the fact that she was drunk and high in her mother's addicted womb. In the womb. Okay, Teresa, you win. <laughs> Fuck, you win. You can't outdo that one, can you? But I'm drinking from 13, having a good time in the park with my mates at the weekend. I'm drinking uh, regularly through high school, through college. I go to university. I'm a party animal, man. I was good at it, and it was good, good to me. Like some people get annoyed, like I had, a really, I had a really good time for a little while there. I had a really good time for, for, a, for a good few years. But it's like, don't get offended, don't worry. I do ruin my life and then want to kill myself. We get there in the end, so you know, it's all right. Um, and, I, and, and I end up, uh, become, I was supposed to become a boring school teacher. And then I become an entrepreneur with my brother instead. Thank God he was already a good businessman. He had an idea for a new venture. 
And uh, we started this business up and we became uh, successful really quickly. It was like a great little story. We had dozens of people working for us. We had about a fleet, a fleet of about 50 vehicles. Within 18 months, we had outstanding invoices of almost $2 million. Like, I had arrived. I was driving a nice sports car and I've got Miss Manchester on my arm. So everything looks cool. But in my mid-20s is when alcoholism starts to come into my life. And alcoholism doesn't come in the form, I don't just wake up one day living down by the river in a tent drinking neat vodka with my big beard. Alcoholism is subtle and progressive. And alcoholism comes in the form of massive amounts of anxiety. And isn't that the worst? And alcoholism comes in the form of massive amounts of depression. And the best descriptive word I can give alcoholism is that something really weird was going on with me. Something really weird. Now, the drinking was still freaking awesome. I'm talking about during the day when I'm not drinking, alcoholism was starting to kick my ass. You put enough drink in me at the night time and maybe a line or something. Now, this is Alcoholics Anonymous and I'll be talking about alcoholism, but I did try cocaine once for 20 years i love that shit i love amphetamines and stuff like that but alcohol is still working for me in the evening you put on you put a couple of strong pints in me i'm like a mixture between james bond dave Chappelle, and harry fucking potter you know what i mean i'm the man but during the day oh my god i'm getting so anxious and i couldn't turn up to these high-powered business meetings that i'd set up the day before and i didn't know what it was I thought I'm becoming just mentally ill like my brother. I'm, is, is, it was so weird and I hated it. And then, and, and, and what, the worst thing about it is that we want, I went running around Manchester pretending that I was okay. Because I get a second full-time job at this stage of my alcoholism. My second full-time job is to run around making sure you think I'm okay. Because if I can convince you I'm okay, maybe I'm going to be okay. And only another alcoholic will understand that. And so I'm drinking myself out of a job. There's four directors. We're a shareholding company. And uh, I just couldn't turn up. My brother was really on to me. I got away with a lot of shit because I was the CEO along with my brother. But he was on to me like I could never make it into work on a Monday morning, ever. My weekends were longer than my week, right? Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights. But, oh, Monday mornings, dude, I could just never get in there. And this one time, I had to put some checks into a bank. It was critically important. And my brother was on to me, so I had to get up for 9 a.m. to put these checks in the bank. And I'm sat in my nice sports car, paralyzed with fear. Paralyzed with fear, shaking. I got the checks in my hand, and I can see the entrance to the bank, and I just can't do it. I can't do it, but I've got to get in there, and I've got to because he's on to me. And do you remember living like that, like that anxiety, that sense of impending doom, thinking that people are talking about you and watching you? And I think to myself, okay, dude, yeah, get it together, okay? And I think, right, I'm going to open the car door, I'm going to scurry off into the entrance of the bank like the rat I am, and if I can do it without the sunlight shattering me into a million pieces, maybe I'll be okay. And I go in there, and there's a goddamn queue. That's a line, people. There's a queue. <laughs> And it's not moving, and I'm stuck in this bank, and I'm sweating even though it's freezing out. And I'm like, oh my God, these women, they're definitely talking about me over there. And like, the line's not moving. I think I'm going to have a nervous mental breakdown any minute. And I was always afraid someone would just catch my eye, like, don't get too close to people, they might really see what's going on. I thought someone's just going to turn around and go, what's wrong with you? I'd be like, fuck, I don't know. Like, do you know? I don't know, and I'd have to leave. I was always worried about that. Things got so bad, we was in a boardroom meeting with me and the three other directors, and, and I wasn't paying attention, of course. I hated those things. And then I heard my brother say, so yeah, Darren, we had a meeting before this meeting. I don't know what's wrong with you, but we've decided to let you go. And I wake up at that time like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, we, we, there's something going on with you. you we, we've noticed you've not, you're having some trouble. And he didn't know what it was. He didn't know it was alcoholism. He just thought I'm a. La he thought I was suffering from something. He thought I had lazy bastarditis, right? <laughs> I wasn't doing my job, and I just got so angry because all my fears were playing out. The mask had slipped enough for my brother to see. Darren's been called out, and so I got furious. I got furious, and I kicked over the table to go and give him a flying headbutt. Right? 
I believe in clear communication, you know what I mean? <laughs> the finance director tackles me. It's just one of those awful scenes where the old classic alcoholic moment where Darren's been found out. And so I have to leave the car there. They're going to cut me a crappy check. It's a Thursday night. I'd already arranged to go out that night, but it's the longest, most miserable, depressing day of my life. I trudge off home. I get changed about five or six o'clock while the mates are coming out at seven or something like that. All I'm thinking about, like any good alcoholic, is how do I get ahead of the story? How do I change the narrative? Because I can't have people talking poorly about me, you know what I mean? And who was in that room? It was only my brother, really, and he's a wanker, dude. He's a <laughs> right wanker. And the other two, where well, we can get away with that. And so I get to the bar. Remember, it's the most miserable day of my life. I get to the bar, and I have a couple of stiff drinks, and woof, the old fierce determination to win comes right back. And here comes my mate Simon, and here comes my other mate Dave, the first two to arrive. I said, did you hear about what happened today? Word had already got around. I said, I told my brother to fuck off. I told him where to go. I told him to shove that job. I built that business up from my bedroom, just full of bravado, full of bullshit, full of myself. But they bought it. They bought it, and that's all I cared about. Many other friends had come in at this point, and I have like an audience, and I'm really on my soapbox now. Yeah, screw me, brother. He's a wanker. I don't need anybody. I can do anything I put my mind to. And I said, you know what I used to like to do when I was a student? I used to like to go traveling. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get me check and I'm going to go traveling. I think I'm going to go to America and I'm going to become president or some shit. That's what I'm going to do. Hey, apparently any fucker can become president over here. <laughs> I thought I'd give it a whirl. I wasn't short of confidence, especially when I'd had a drink. And so I think the problem is the shitty UK weather. I think the problem is my brother, he's a right wanker, right? I think the problem is my girlfriend, she keeps leaving me for stupid little things like my cheating on her. But no, somebody puts the problem on a flight at Manchester International Airport and flies him all the way to LAX. And my cousin, who I've never met before, who'd been living in Santa Barbara 20 years, comes and picks me up at LAX. He owns an English bar in downtown Santa Barbara. See, there is a God. I came to America just to take the edge off, dude. I came to America for a two-week holiday 23 years ago. I never made it home. I never made it home. I didn't know I was going to circle the drain of life and almost die of untreated alcoholism. I thought I'm just going to have a good time. Now, when I'm on holiday, I like to have a drink. I don't know about you. You have to fill a visa waiver out on the plane, and it allows you to stay for three months. So I was only coming for a couple of three weeks, and I was having such a good time. And the blur, just drinking, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe I should calm down on the drugs, maybe I shouldn't do so much Jägermeister, but all that shit went out the window, and as soon as I got to the bar and I became a local, and so I stayed drunk for three, uh, three months straight, having a great time. A friend who, who came over from Manchester bought an SUV and we travelled the whole of America for the next five months. The whole of America. 32 states, 12,000 miles. We saw everything a tourist would want to see. It was amazing. I was drunk off my ass in every little town, city and state. By the time we got back to Santa Barbara, I had seven outstanding warrants in five different states. <laughs> I mean, and I'm an illegal alien, by the way, as well. Like, whatever that means, you know. But I had a good time. That means I had a good time. My friend who's normal flew back to England. And I become a drunk bartender in my cousin's pub. Oh my God, but I am hanging on by a thread. Hanging on by a thread. My lack of responsibility had really masked my alcoholism. Because if you think about it, staying drunk isn't the problem. I had the money, I'm on my travels. Staying drunk isn't the problem. It's a problem for other people, but it's not a problem for me. It's a problem for bosses. It's a problem for the authorities. It's a problem for spouses. But it ain't for me. The problem is facing life sober. I'm supposed to go to work somewhat sober and looking presentable. That's the real difficulty for any alcoholic. And my anxiety is just through the roof. So I am just like, I'm the drunkest person in the bar and I'm the bartender. That is not a good look. That is not a good look. I would come to and I would be like panicking. I'd come to like, I couldn't even remember. Did I work the day before? Did I not work the day before? 
Jägermeisters coming out of every pore. I'm just like, oh my God, what is wrong with me? I used to be somebody. Other people used to rely on me. I was responsible for others. And now I just can't keep my shit together at all. And I have to get a drink before going to work. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, as long as it's not a Wednesday, like I'm having a nervous mental breakdown. I, I have to go to the local bar and have a quick drink. I feel like I'm not a loser if I'm drinking in a pub. You know, I haven't discovered the morning, morning drink yet. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh my God, please, as long as it's a day off, please don't be a Wednesday because I've got to work on Wednesdays. And I go, like, oh my God, it's Wednesday. <laughs> and it's 9 a.m. and I've got to be at work at 9.30. So I have a solution and it's alcohol. And I jump into the shower. I get on my bike because I don't want another DUI. And I'm bombing it down State Street. Huge delivery trucks are coming up the other way and I fantasize about going under them. And it would look like an accident. And only you know what I mean by that. But I would get to Dargan's Irish Pub. Because my plan is to go to Dargan's Irish Pub to finagle a drink off the lovely bartender before going across the road to the English bar, the press room. And so I'd get to Dargan's Irish Pub, I'd put my bike there, I'd put my hand on the door handle. Then in the nanosecond before opening it up, I've changed my mind half a dozen times. Just go out onto State Street and kill yourself. No, not now. And I open the door to this massive, empty Irish Dargan's pub. And there's beautiful Irish Yvonne. She was so gorgeous, way out of my league. I love that, that girl. And she'd be always the bartender. And I was trying to pretend, how can I make it look normal to have a drink? Who else needs a drink at 9.20? And so we're going in there and I'm like this, oh my God, I'm dying, I'm dying. And she turned my way and I went like this, hey, hey, you know, pretending everything's okay. And she said, Jesus, Darren, how you doing, young fella? I said, I'm okay, but I went out last night, Yvonne, and I shouldn't have gone out. There's always a reason to go out in Santa Barbara. I said, and I think I've got the flu, but I'm dying and I've, I've got to go over to work there. But I, I wanted to get my shift covered, but I've had the previous 14 Wednesdays covered because I've gone to work with a hangover so bad, most people are dialed 911. And I'm trying to finagle a drink into the conversation. And magically she said, would you like a pint? And I said, fuck yes. Oh yes, I'd like a pint. Now here's the problem. I don't think I can wait the 30 seconds it's going to take her to pour this thing. Because I'm hanging on by a thread. And she goes around the bar and I'm just like this. Oh my God. And she glanced my way and I go, hey, hey. And she finally finishes pouring it. And she brings it round towards me. And she puts it there. But she stands there, smiling, just looking right at me, you know, like she wants to chit-chat or some shit. And I just want to pull my knife out and stab her in the neck, dude. Stab her in the neck, get that awkward bit over with. I get me pint, I finish me pint, but it's not quite done the trick, man. It's not quite done the trick, it's not strong enough. I'm like, Yvonne, I don't know if I can do it or not, but I gotta go. And she said, would you like a Jaeger? It's like liquid heroin. I said, oh yes. And she doesn't bother with the little shot glass bullshit. She gives me a tumbler full of that stuff. And I feel better just watching her pour that sucker right to the top. And I get that thing and I glug it down. Glug, 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 glug. Woo. Whoa, hey. Within 30 seconds, woof. I've gone from a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck to a man brimming over his self-reliance like that. Like that, the effect produced by alcohol, dude. That's why we drink. Now I'm going to work in my bar. I might even come back and shag Yvonne on my break. You know what I mean? If she's lucky. I go to work. I, I, overshoot, I overshoot the mark. I get fired the next day from that job. 18 months. I should have been fired after my first shift. Get down here now. Ooh, another mask has slipped. Horrible, classic alcoholic moment. Darren's been found out. I go down there, I'm crying. Please don't fire me, Raph, please don't. I had a job where you're actually allowed to have a little cheeky drink. And I even screwed that up. I couldn't just make it to one or two just to take the edge off. I always overdid it. I always overshot the mark. He's all, no, get out of here. He says, you'll never work in this pub again. You need to go rehab, you need to go to England. You need to do something, but you'll never be in here, working here again. So I went down the next day to my bar to see you took my shift and I threw a pint over him. How to ostracize yourself from everybody in a nanosecond. Darren, get out of here. We never want to see you again. It took me like two weeks to get barred from every pub in downtown Santa Barbara. 
James Joyce, O'Malley's, Old King's Road. The sportsman is very difficult to get back from, and we achieved that as well. And now I'm just like living to drink. I'm not a cute drunk. I'm not a functioning alcoholic. I'm a vodka drinking nightmare maniac, dude. And so a typical day for me is, uh, so I'm living in a the shitty house in a crappy room on the west side of town. No one wants anything to do with me. I'm at the back of the house with its own entrance and bathroom, completely off f away from the rest of the guys that live there who want nothing to do with me. I haven't seen anybody for months and months and months. And a typical day is I would uh, come to and it would be pitch black outside and I have no idea whether it's night or day. I would figure it out, it's 5 a.m. that darkest hour before the dawn. Now I have strong horrible vodka under my bed at this stage of my drinking because I'll need it at first daylight but I so desperately didn't want to drink because I knew what that meant. But I could only wait 10 or 15 minutes, literally, because the mental and hellish torture was so bad, I'm on edge right away. And I got the sense of impending doom. Now I know why we have that sense of impending doom. It's because something bad is going to happen when you're living life the way we're living it. So 10 or 15 minutes of, of, of about to have a nervous mental breakdown, I'm hearing voices, I'm hearing my name being called from outside in the darkness, I'm hearing my name from under the bed, it's just me and the voices and I'm like, oh my God, I just can't do this. Now, I'm drinking from tall bottles of vodka and I always have four fingers left in the bottom of it because it's like a science project. That's exactly what I will need, not to become Superman again, just to take the thoughts of suicide away, just to dumb me down enough, because we've cracked our minds, right? I've drank so much hard alcohol, I've ruined me wiring. There's no coming back from this. And so I need that just to dumb me down enough so I don't have to throw myself off a bridge. Now, I finish that vodka, throw the bottle off to the side. And here, but here's the problem. I've just fed the beast, and now the beast needs feeding, dude. And so I've got to put on my smelly, baggy clothing to go to Foodland liquor store market less than one block away from my place. And one time I'm, I'm, I'm going to Foodland, it's not even 6 a.m., man, and I'm going to Foodland and I walk past this big shop front window on my way there and it was, I look at me reflecting, it was so outrageous, I came back to take a look. And I go up to the window, I'm like, oh my God, I got, my hair is everywhere and matted down. I've got a big ass bushy beard. I'm sunken down, so underweight. I'm yellow with jaundice. I look 15 years older than I should have. And I remember I muttered to myself, I went, wow, I'd better not tell anyone about that and carried on to Foodland <laughs> to steal me two big bottles of vodka and go clinking off home. <clears throat> now, it's not like you, you go home and pound the vodka and pass out. No, 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 no. It's like a science project. It is immensely important that that first bottle of vodka gets me into the later afternoon because the second bottle has to get me into the evening, leaving enough. I'm trying to get to 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or maybe even 11 o'clock at night to pass out and maybe catch a good enough sleep to wake up and not have to drink like that ever again. And it says the mind and body are marvellous mechanisms. I drank like that for two more years. Two more years of jails, institutions and death and then I started turning up at Alcott's Anonymous drunk. Here's how I got sober. I came to one morning and there was no vodka under my bed. There wasn't even an empty bottle. That had never ever happened to me before and I took it as a sign, this is the day I'm going to kill myself. And I was fine with that. I tried to kill myself two months prior. All my roommates were downtown partying, having excluded me again of course. And I remembered... It was midnight, one of them had an arsenal of weapons. And so I broke into his bedroom, I jimmied the door, broke in, found all the guns, all the weapons. Now I'm English, I don't really know what I'm doing with a gun. <laughs> but I found the loaded gun, I go stumbling into the living room, I sit down, I put it in my mouth, it's cold on my teeth, it's heavy. And I'm thinking, do I blow the back of my head off or do you shoot up through the roof of your mouth? And then the thought came to me, Darren, it's midnight. If you pull the trigger right now, you'll definitely wake the neighbours up and I'm too polite for that shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I just 
throw the gun in the living back in the room, go back to my miserable part of the house and finish the job. One month after that, I tried to kill myself again. I found a bottle of pills. Dude, I googled, this shit should have, could have killed a goddamn elephant. I, I took the whole bottle of pills, washed it down with a whole bottle of vodka, and some of us don't die. I came to, I had a rotten stomach for well over a month. But today is the day. I stayed in my bedroom for a couple of hours, deliberating how to do it, cool as a cucumber, sober as a judge, figuring it out, and I decided to throw myself off Santa Barbara's biggest bridge, Cold Springs Bridge. It's like a popular suicide spot for our area, a bit like the Golden Gate. I, I, 10 a.m., I jump in my shitty beat-up vehicle, I drive 20 minutes up the mountain road, I park the car, I walk to the center of the bridge, I'd been on that bridge before, and I pause because I know it's gonna kill me mum. And in that, in that pause, Grace came in. And Grace came in the form of a man in Alcox Anonymous who told me the truth and called me on my bullshit. I used to share when I was drinking, I used to share inappropriately, like, this thing sucks, alcohol and doesn't work, I'm going to kill myself. And he pulled me off to the side, he said, come here, you little fuck. <laughs> he said, first of all, you might well kill yourself. So what? You won't be the first and you won't be the last. But you can't say AA doesn't work. I said, I've been coming here for a year, old man. He said, well, first of all, Darren, you should come sober. It works better. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, a drunk like you, you need to get a sponsor and you need to work the 12 steps and you need to have a psychic change or spiritual awakening. I'm thinking all this on the bridge going, God, it's right. I had two big secrets in, in AA. One was I didn't have a sponsor and the other one, I definitely don't know what the steps are. And so, like, I really sincerely took a position. I, I said to myself, I said, right, fuck, all right, all right. I'm going to go to that, I'm going to go to that AA bullshit. I'm going to do them stupid 12 steps. And when they don't work, I'm going to go and find that man. And we're going to have a little chit chat. I'll take him off the bridge with me, right? <laughs> now, I know at this stage of my alcoholism that I need to be medically detoxed. I can't just come skipping into the rooms, you know, where's Neil, he knows what he's doing, take me through this, no. I need to be medically detoxed. And so I get in my car, I drive all the way back down the 20 minute mountain road, because I've got to go to Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital emergency room and I park in my usual spot. I'd been there four times already that year and it was only April. Now, as I'm pulling into the parking lot, I sideswipe the car next to me. I've just driven down a goddamn mountain road and I crash in the car park of the emergency room. The police are around the corner, they come over and I'm getting out of the car, it's parked straight, I did hate this guy, like, and, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry, that was my fault. This is my car, I've got my ID, but I need to go into the hospital, I've got some health issues. There's two cops, one of them kind of walks behind me and he's almost like rooting for me. He's wondering what's going on. The other cop comes right up to me. He's about to say something else. And then he goes, whoa, have you been drinking? And I think that's a weird first question. I said, no, mate, have you? <laughs> they don't like that approach. He said, you reek of alcohol. I said, I have not had a drink today, sir. He said, uh, right, well, uh, I said, I need to go into the hospital. He said, you're doing some field sobriety tests. I said, okay. Now it's about 11 a.m. I do all his field sobriety tests for about 25 minutes, perfectly. He's pissed. He looks at his colleague, his colleague goes like this. He's like, oh, you're doing some more. I said, okay, I do another round of 10 or 15 minutes. And then he says, you, you reek about, you need to blow into this device. I blow into his breathalyzer and I blow a 0 0.32. Now I haven't even had a drink yet. <laughs> I'm waking up at a 0 0.32 and then I'm drinking me two big bottles of vodka. They cannot believe it. They literally cannot believe it. Like anything over a 0.3, vital organs, for not, not for you lot, not for normal people, vital organs stop working. And at a 0.4, which I would get to very quickly, many of them are in a coma, and it's a medical fact, many of them would die, right? So these guys are just jibber-jabbering, and I'm like, is this a good thing, or is this a bad thing? And then he comes towards me, he starts to take the handcuffs off, and then I start to panic. Have you ever detoxed in jail? Oh my God, I said, whoa, whoa, what are you doing, man? He said, turn around, you're going to jail. I said, I said, if you take me to jail right now, I will kill somebody, dude. I said, I'm small, but I'm fucking dangerous, dude. <laughs> 
And I start to use the language of Alcott's Anonymous. I start to admit, I, I need to go back to AA. I need to get a sponsor. I need to do this. I need to do that. Now, they arrest me, of course, but they decide not to take me to jail. And they take me to the local police station, which felt so much safer for me. I was so, be forever grateful for that. And now I'm handcuffed in the back of the squad car. Now we're driving to the police station. Now we're getting along great. They radio ahead and they tell the colleagues, hey, we've got this Irishman. And he blew a point three two. I said, I'm English, you moron. I said, like, oh my God. <laughs> they take me in there and they, they fingerprint me. I'm chatting with everybody. I think I broke a local record for DUI. And uh, then somebody that they know and trust comes and picks me up to take me back to Five East, the local lockdown psychiatric unit. But it's like, so what? I'd been there three times already and I'd gotten drunk twice on the way home from there. Here's the difference. The difference is I had hit bottom. Now, hitting bottom gets misrepresented in the rooms of AA a lot. Hitting bottom for me is very, very particular. That wasn't my worst drunk at all. I'd been way worse off. But hitting bottom is this. It is when you ask somebody for help and follow through with all the directions. Imagine it, because the rest of it is just a bunch of bullshit from your and my war story. Like I have my guys, some of my guys have been to prison. Like I've never been to prison. Like, no, Darren, I hit bottom. I was in prison, dude. I was involved in gang warfare, stabbing people, drinking Pruno out the bed frame. I'm like, dude, that's a bad story, my man. But you're having it bottom. You're doing the same old shit. Some girl told me like she was selling her body on State Street so she could get high 10 minutes later. I'm like, listen, love, that's a bad story. But you're having it bottom. I'd hit bottom and I was about to prove it. Now, I need to go, I want to go to the lockdown psychiatry unit. I love me. It sounds a little bit depressing, doesn't it? The lockdown psychiatry unit. It is a bit like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> and you young'uns will have to Google that shit and all. But I love me some lockdown psychiatry unit, dude. I love it. Because you know what's coming my way? A lot of narcotics are coming my way, dude. Because all thoughts of sobriety go out the window because I'm having the DTs and I need to get loaded to the gills. And, so, and I know the drill in these, this place. You know, they take you in this secure elevator up to the fifth floor, which is off from everything else. They take you in, the door clicks behind you. And after you, get, you have to do your intake and you go to that little window with a medication window. And I know this woman and she knows me. And I'm like, how are you doing, Mary, love? Did you have a nice Christmas? <laughs> She's just shaking her head. I'm like, Murray, I'm going to need my usual cocktail, please. I would like 118 Valiums, two pints of Syroquil, whatever the fuck they are on the top shelf. Those pink things look amazing. And I would like my usual uh, room, unless that's taken, and I'll have the penthouse suite, and she's shaking her head. She gives me all the medications. I wolf all the medications down as much as I can get. Woof, loaded to the gills. Loaded to the gills, and now I can start judging people again. <laughs> right? I was going to kill myself two hours ago. Now I'm king of the nut job ward. You know what I mean? <laughs> she take, they take my laces off me. They take my belt off me so I don't hang myself in this happy place. And back then you used to like change into like a robe, like a hospital robe or whatnot. Now I know exactly what I need to do. Now that I'm in the lockdown crazy psychiatric ward, I know exactly what I need to do. I need to go and find myself a little girlfriend in the lockdown psychiatric unit. Isn't that what you all do? You gotta find yourself a little crazy girlfriend. And where does everybody hang out? They hang out in the day room, in the TV room. So I'm loaded to the gills, go wandering down the hallway, open the door with a big thud so everyone can look my way and I look at all the minions, all these losers. Look at all these people. Look at all these crazy people. There's a girl over there banging her head against the wall. There's a guy over here talking to himself and then I see her. Oh, I see her. She's gorgeous. She's doing laps around the couch. She's going around the couch going... Aah! Aah! She's got this long black hair in front of her face. She's got these unusually long arms. She looks like that girl out of the movie. What's it called? The fucking ring or some shit. I'm like, oh my God, look at her. And I go on over there and I slide in there and I grab her by the hand and we do laps together until we fall madly in love. 
then they detox me from the alcohol with the drugs and then they detox me from the drugs and then they pop me out sober one more time 11 days later so what I got out on a Wednesday afternoon and I did not take a drink which is an absolute miracle I went to a very powerful men's stag called the junkyard dogs we woof and everything in that meeting dude it is amazing 80 or 90 men are outside this meeting all smoking fags and drinking coffee and having a good time. Dozens of them were properly armed with the facts about themselves and the illness of alcoholism. I went straight up to Mike, first guy I saw. I said, big book thumper. I said, Mike, I just got out again today, dude. I said, I'm going to drink tonight, man. You know it. I know it. What do I have to do? And he looked at me and said, wow, Darren, are you sober right now? He says, yep, never seen me sober all oh, year. He said, oh my God, this is amazing. He said, normally we do some reading, might do the 60 pages and the ABCs. He said, he said, let's get into action, man. Let's do a third step prayer right now. Dude, I don't pray. I definitely don't pray on my knees. I don't believe in God. I hate religion. I said, what do you mean, Mike, in front of these 80 men? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay. I said, okay, because the no had been beaten out of me, dude. Darren wasn't too cool for school anymore. Darren was about to conform to the process. And we did a third step prayer in front of everybody. We went into that meeting. It was great. I went home from that meeting and I wrote 100 names on my resentment inventory. 100, I passed out, I woke up at 5 a.m. shaking and baking, I wrote 100 more names. I called this man, it wasn't even 6 a.m., I was going to drink, he gave me my next column and saved my life. I called him 12 times that day to finish all three inventories. I went to his house the next day and we did my fifth step, it took us about three and a half hours. He sent, it, he sent me home for my hour and gave me a big hug and said, Darren, this has never happened to me before. This is amazing. I said, I'm glad you feel good, Mike. I feel like shit, dude. <laughs> he said, oh, don't worry, man. Trust in the process. The next day we did six and seven. I didn't understand them, but I was, I was full of humility and I was willing to do whatever. Then I transferred my list and I added to my list. I already had my list. I just transferred it and added to it. On my fourth or fifth day of sobriety, I went around Santa Barbara and made 21 amends. 21 amends in all the stores, the shops, any women that came by my way. 21 amends and I was lit up like a Christmas tree, dude. I was lit up. I was rocketed into a fourth dimension. I couldn't believe how good I felt. I'd gone from suicidal on awakening for the previous two plus years to having a full heart and not knowing what to do with it. Like, oh my God, everything made sense. This is why Jeremy's so into fucking AA and doing these brilliant commitments and being of service. This is why Neil does what he does. This is why you guys are sponsoring people and you're all in. You're all in because you must get a full heart. I'm like, oh my God, everything made sense. Because I saw, I felt, I believed. I'm like, you want to call this God? I don't give a shit. This is amazing. It made sense why my mum liked to go to church on a Sunday. My little old mum. Most boring hour of my life. But it must fill her little heart. I understood. I felt, I felt so good. I got up the next day and I went to Foodland Liquor. I asked to speak to the manager. I said, hey man, I, I, I'm a really bad drunk. I live less than one block away on San Pasquale Street. I said, I said I, I, and I'm... I've been stealing vodka from your store for well over a year, man. I said, I'm living my life a different way. I'll never steal from you or anyone else ever again. I said, I've added it up and it comes to $2,750. I said, I've just started work. It's Friday. I've just started work two days ago. For the first time in years, there's $25. $25. It was a demonstration. I said, I'll be back every Friday with $25 till I've paid that whole amount off and any interest you determine. I said, is there anything else I can do to make this right? And he looked at me and he went, wow. 
And I went, wow, and floated off to make some more financial amends. Because <laughs> I couldn't believe how good it felt to give you your money back. I said to my sponsor, fuck, what's next? He said, 10 and 11. I said, 10 and 11, what's that? He said, 10 and 11, I'll, for 10, I'll show you what to do right here, right now for 10. To postpone the punishment of alcoholism. I'll show you what to do for 11. I'll sandwich the day. Two minutes in the morning, two minutes at night. Two minutes of meditation. You're already praying your little English ass off. And two minutes of reviewing your day at night. And I'm just like, what? He knew I was already a recovered alcoholic. He knew. He's like, yeah, Darren, you do all this, all of it. You, you, you can stay sober one day at a time for the rest of your life. And I, I can't cut any corners, man. I have to do all of it. Like, I'm like, two minutes, two minutes. I said, fuck, I am in. Dude, I am in. I'm not pussy, I'm in, man. Two minutes, two minutes. Like, dude. And it's not like I like meditation, but I have to work what I call the guaranteed version of sobriety. The guaranteed version. I can't skip a fifth step. You can't skip a fifth step, can you? No, no one would have that bullshit. You can't skip a nine step. When did it become okay to skip an 11th step? I don't know. I have to do my shitty program. Now, I dislike meditation just like you probably do, right? It's actually taken me 19 years to go from two minutes meditation to 10 minutes meditation. 19 years. But God loves him a little trier. God loves him, a little fucking trayer. My God, my cool ass God is up there laughing his bearded ass off at me down there in my bedroom doing my shitty prayer meditation every morning. <laughs> laughing his ass off, going, look at that little fuck down there. Look at him, that little wanker doing his shitty prayer meditation and he sucks at it. But then he says, you know what? You know what? Check. Give that little fuck another day of sobriety. <laughs> That's what my God's like. He doesn't care I'm a potty mouth man from Manchester. He cares about my actions. And he cares about my helping others, which I do relentlessly. Dude, steps 10 and 11 are the keys to the kingdom. Steps 10 and 11 are so simple, you won't do it. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Only an alcoholic will burn his life to the ground, come run into a 12-step program just to resist the 12 steps. <laughs> what is wrong with us? But I am in. Dude, I am in working the guaranteed version of sobriety. I got to do it all, man. I got to go to many meetings a week. I got to sponsor all these guys. I got to do h and I. I've got to have the service commitments. Man, I sponsor so many people. And I have to do all this just to be normal. Some of us are sicker than others. I have to work a hell of a program just to feel normal. Some of you get that, and I love you that get that. I can't go to one speaker meeting a week and be good and giddy. I got to do a lot of stuff. I sponsor so many men in Santa Barbara. I do so much AA. I should be the Dali fucking Lama or some <laughs> shit. But no, I do all that just to be normal, just to be another bozo on the bus. Dude, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. This is unbelievable. We have entered the world of the spirit. And this is for fun and for free. And why do we resist it so much? I don't know. Because we're just wired that way. It's crazy. I've had so many, the, the, the people who have stayed around and who are active members of Alcoholics Anonymous, what we get is a full heart every now and then, sometimes for quite a long every now and then. That's the payoff, the full heart where you feel at peace and you're just glowing and you're grateful and everything's fucking awesome. That's why we do it. We've entered the world of the spirit. I've had so many hundreds of we've entered the world of the spirit moments. I think I should give a talk just on that. When I get better, I'll give a talk just on that because it's unbelievable. But those of you that are active members of AA know what I'm talking about. I'll finish with this last story. I, so I get asked to talk a little bit because I have a funny accent. That goes my way, right? Now, I was speaking at an Akipo convention in the Bay Area of California. All California young people's and Alcott's Anonymous, this is the biggest one they've got. 
uh, go, go on 3,000 of these young maniacs descend on the Hilton complex in the Bay Area, right? Now, I'm the closeout speaker. Most of these little folks have gone home, so that made my resentment inventory. Some of these guys ended up in the emergency room because they've overdosed on Red Bull, you know what I mean? But don't worry, they gave them a monster drip and they were all right. Now, it's a Sunday morning and I'm the closeout speaker and there's a girl next to me. She's going to give a talk before me. There's eight or 900 people all looking at us and we're going to give the talk, <clears throat> but she's on her phone texting. And I think that's really rude, right? I hate that. It's really rude. Uh, so she's on her phone. Now, of course, but it's none of my business. And so I get involved right away. <laughs> so what the fuck? What are you doing, man? <laughs> now, she's having a problem. We're in the Bay Area. I'm from Santa Barbara, which is 300 miles that way. She, she's come from L.A. She's texting her sponsor in L.A. Now, her sponsor got sober 21 years previously. Uh, 20 of them in this rehab all got sober. Nobody stayed sober. Many of, a few of them died. They're all relapses apart from her and this one other guy. When he was 90 days sober, he moved to Maui, Hawaii, raised a family and started doing AA over there. He had two boys, one who's 20 years old and one who's 19 years old. His two boys are on the mainland somewhere dying of untreated alcoholism. The only number he has is hers and they haven't talked forever. He texts her she texts her. She says to me, well, I'm trying to give, get a male phone number. Can I give him your number? I said, yeah, give him my number. We give our talks. Everything goes great. Now I'm in the car, flying, flying home on the freeway. Now, when I talk out of town, a lot of the times I take my tough guys with me. You know, you've got to take your tough guys, you know, the tatted up, sleeved up guys on the neck and shit. You've got to take these tough guys with you because you never know. You might run into some of them any fucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> And so we're in the car, we're driving down, and I remembered, oh, I've got to call this guy. I call him and he's on speakerphone. He answers the phone. I said, hey, it's Darren. I'm just leaving a convention. This guy just starts crying his eyes out, man. He's crying his eyes out, and he can't catch his breath. And it's such a moment of humility, and, and, and I want to cry, but I can't because I'm with these tough guys, you know what I mean? And then I look over at the guy next to me and like, wait a fucking minute. Are you crying, dude? <laughs> this guy's crying. I look in the mirror at the guys in the back. I'm like, oh my God, you've got tattoos on your face, you pussy. <laughs> we're all crying. Now we're all crying. We can't catch our breath. Finally, this guy gets it together and he says, Darren, thank you so much for calling me. I've never asked anything of anyone in Alcott's Anonymous. But please, if my boys need it, please let the hand of AA be there. I said, dude, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm pretty well connected in. What, what state are they in? Where are they? I'll do anything I can to help. He said, they both attend Santa Barbara City College. I said, I work at Santa Barbara City College. We have entered the world of the spirit. Dude, this is amazing. And I go and meet both of those young men. One of them has become a proud member of the junkyard dogs. The other one is dying of untreated alcoholism. The yin and the yang of Alcott's Anonymous. And isn't it just like that? Now, if you're having a problem with God, I'll leave you with this. Religion might be for those people that are trying to avoid going to hell. Spirituality is for people that have been to hell. Thank you all. <laughs>